Well, you may be seated. And good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, if you have a Bible, you can turn with us. You know, it took us five weeks to get through Acts chapter two. If you're new, I'm Pastor Brian. It's so glad to be here with you. I'd hope you'd stick around. I'd love to meet you personally. Uh, but we've been going through this book of Acts series. It took us five weeks to get through Acts chapter two. There was just so much in there. And Acts chapter three, we're gonna do all today, all in one week today. So we get, you kind of have to strap in because we're gonna go quick. And it's a story, if you don't know the story in Acts chapter three, so, okay, so Acts, for those of you who haven't been here, Acts chapter two is where, uh, where the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples and the, the church age began. The church began. So, so Jesus, in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus came, Jesus, the Son of God, he came. He lived a perfect sinless life. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Then he ascended to heaven. But before he ascended to heaven in Acts chapter one, he told his disciples, go to Jerusalem, wait in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you and you're gonna be my witnesses. And sure enough, in Acts chapter two, that's just what happened. The Holy Spirit descended upon the, the, the apostles, the believers, and they started telling people about Jesus in languages that they'd never studied before. And thousands of people got saved. It was amazing. It was a, it was a miracle. It was amazing. And so what happened basically in Acts chapter two is the church got started. Maybe you never thought of it like that. You, you probably thought the church always existed. No, the church is a New Testament thing. And in the Old Testament, we had the Israelites who were the people of God. In the New Testament, we have now the church being the people of God. And we're gonna find out, if you stick with us through the book of Acts, we're gonna find out that it's, the church isn't just about one nationality. It's not just about the Israelites anymore. It's actually gonna be opened up, God is gonna open up a relationship with himself to all kinds of people, and I say thank you, Jesus, for that, because I'm not Jewish. I'm a Gentile, like many of you, I'm just, I could just tell, you're all Gentiles in here, right? West Haven, you're all Gentiles, you just look like Gentiles. So. Gentiles are non-Jewish people. We're the, the message of Jesus, the offer, the offer of relationship with God was extended to the whole world, and it started in Acts chapter two. It actually started with Jesus. It actually started in the very beginning. This was something that was intended to be the case all along, but if you read the Old Testament, it seems like it's just about the Jewish people. Now we have in the New Testament for the first seven chapters of, of the book of Acts, it's mainly going to be centered around Jerusalem and the Jewish people, but soon enough, once we get to Acts chapter eight and Acts chapter nine, the message of Jesus is gonna go out to all kinds of people, and pretty soon, the Christian church is gonna be its own thing, separate from Judaism. Now, we're in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter three, and again, it's, it's hard for us to think of it like this, but the Christian church wasn't it was a Jewish thing at this moment in history. Just, I wanna make sure you know that. We're gonna see that Peter and John are at the temple. And the reason they're at the temple is because they still thought of themselves as Jewish, but they thought of themselves as Jewish Christians. And so they're at the temple and, and they're gonna be there for a little while, but we're gonna see, especially next week, we're gonna see what happens when all of a sudden, so come back next week, when all of a sudden the, the real question about authority comes up who is really, who, who really has spiritual authority? That'll be for next week. But, but for this week, we're gonna look at Acts chapter three, and before we get to that, Peter and John are gonna perform a miracle, and then next week in Acts chapter four, the spiritual authorities of the, Jew, of the temple are gonna challenge them about performing a miracle and talking about Jesus so much, and so there's a showdown, like an authority showdown next week, and, and all that's, we're gonna talk more about kind of this new movement, this Christian movement that started 2,000 years ago. But anyway, today, in, before we get there, today we're gonna really answer this question um, that as I read this text, I thought this is the question that real, we really wanna answer today. Can Christians really name it and claim it? How many of you ever heard of name it, name it and claim it ministries or like word of faith, or prosperity gospel. This is, these are the, uh, let me just give you a little intro before we get into it, because I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. And some of you maybe unknowingly listen to these people or read some of their books or watch them on TV, and I'll say it, I say it many times, I'm gonna say it again. These tend to be people who have beautiful locks of hair, and they're preaching to you on TV, 
And, it, you know, their teeth are all white, not coffee stained like mine. Don't believe these people. These people can't be trusted. But there are so many people in the world today, especially in the U.S., who preach this version of Christianity that I guess you could argue originated in Acts chapter three. Because in Acts chapter three, we see this, we, spoiler alert, we're gonna see this miracle. Peter performs this miracle. And name it and claim it people would say, see, that proves that we're right. So here's what name it and claim it teaching is. And I, I'm not... We don't like to like tear down other people's ministries. I, don't, I honestly don't like to do this, but I, I think this is so dangerous today. And I think that everyday Christians end up falling for this kind of teaching and it's, and it's unbiblical and, it's, and it'll lead you astray. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity to preach about it. It's called the Word of Faith Movement or the Name It, Claim It or the Health and Wealth or the Prosperity Gospel. People like... Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen. Some of these people have traces, if not more than traces, in their teaching. And here's where it comes from. I, I, I want to make sure that you understand where this teaching comes from in history and how it doesn't have biblical roots, but it, turned, it was a secular teaching that turned into biblical, that, that was sort of taken over by some Christian teachers and it made its way into the Christian church, and it's super dangerous. And you might have fallen for it, or at least for some of it. So let me, let me expose it today. First of all, it started with the New Thought Movement. This began in the 19th century, and it was, it was this guy named Phineas Quimby. You can Google it and look it up. He lived in the early 1800s. He was a spiritual healer. He was a mesmerist, which was like the early hypnotists. Before hypnotists were around, he was a mesmerist. So he was actually like a, like a practicing physician, and he taught the power of positive thinking. He taught the power of positive thinking. It's called the New Thought Movement. And basically he said, like, you can, if you can think it, it can happen. You can name it and you can claim it. So this guy, he wasn't Christian. He was a religious, spiritual person, but he wasn't a Christian person. And he was preaching this stuff. He was teaching this stuff. One of his, one of his clients who went to him for this hyp hypnotist stuff was someone by the name of Mary Baker Eddy. If you know your spiritual history, you know that this is the founder of the Christian Science Movement, which also is not actually Christian. By the way, just because it has the name Christian or Jesus in the name doesn't mean it's Christian. You just need to know that. You need to make sure to look at their beliefs. So anyway, Christian Science came out of this, and then later on, a guy named E.W. Kenyon came out, and he, he took this new thought teaching, and he began to integrate it with biblical teachings and started writing some pretty popular books. And eventually he, he was kind of the founder basically of this power of positive thinking. I know what some of you are saying is, wait a second, so should we think negatively? No, I don't think we should think negatively. I think you should think positively, but, but this movement takes it too far. This movement basically, to, here are a few core teachings of this movement. Number one, Kenneth Copeland is one, of the, is one of the guys that maybe you've heard of today who teaches this stuff. And again, that doesn't mean that everything Kenneth Copeland teaches is wrong. But so much of the core of what he's teaching is not biblical. Here, let me give you three examples. Number one, he, he teaches about a godlike nature. Here's what he teaches. Is that before the fall, Adam had a godlike nature. Now the Bible says that he was created, that Adam, that we were created in the image of God. But Copeland goes too far with it. And he says that actually Adam had a godlike nature saying basically that Adam had the power to speak things into existence like God did. So basically he says that Adam was a little God, like lowercase g, God. Now that should make all of you nervous to hear something like that. That's not true. The Bible says God spoke things into existence. He doesn't say that we can speak things into existence. But this new thought movement, or this 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 kind of word of faith movement says, no, just like, just like God could speak things into existence, Adam had the power of positive confession. He could speak things into existence, but then he fell. Sin entered the world. And when sin entered the world, here's what this teaching says. When sin entered the world, they lost the, humans lost the ability to speak things into the world until Jesus came. And Jesus died and rose from the dead 
And Jesus redeemed us, and because of the work of Jesus, he brought us back to this place, like where Adam was, where now, if we're Christians, we have that same power once again, if you're a Christian. Do you see, do you see how dangerous this is? So he's reading his, what he wants to believe, he's reading it into scripture, he's formulating all these beliefs around it, and he's... So he's talking about God-like nature. He's talking about the power of positive confession. And he talks about this thing called the faith force. He, he's, here's a quote from him literally. He says, faith is a spiritual force. It's a substance. Faith has the ability to affect natural substance. So he says, you can, because of this, you can, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, that in the name of Jesus, you have the power to speak something into existence. You can access this faith force and speak something into existence. So, for example, you can say, I want that new job, and you can speak it into existence, and God is obligated to give you that job. Because you can speak it, because you can name it, and you can claim it. And here's the thing. People love this. They love this idea. I mean, it appeals to your, it appeals to your, like your sense of power and control, it's saying, you're in control, you have power. And so not just in the United States, but all around the world, people, in fact, it's really sad because in third world countries, this is taking off as well. But it's not biblical, and we're gonna see that today. Paul warned about this, 2 Timothy 4, verses three and four, he says this, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching, they will follow their own desires. They will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. I want you to hear this. The word of faith movement is a myth. It's not true. Now again, some of you in here or some of you at West Haven might be listening to this saying, I like some of these guys. I, uh, here's all I'm gonna ask is I just ask you to hear me out as we take a look at Acts chapter three and see what the Bible actually says, because I think the word of faith movement is really dangerous. The reason it's dangerous is because when you try to name it and claim it and then God doesn't give it to you, guess what happens? You reject God. This, this philosophy, this doctrine puts you on the throne of your life. Christianity puts God on the throne of your life and there can't be two people there. That, that's a, it's a one-seater, it's not a tandem thing, right? Only God can be on the throne of your life. And the problem with this, this, this word of faith movement, it says that it's your words, it's your faith, that's the power, you have the power, you're like a little mini God, and that is, that is not unlike the, the lie that Satan has spread from the beginning. And we're gonna see it today in this story that seems like a word of faith story, but I wanna show you, I wanna show you that it's so much more than that. So here we go, Acts chapter three. Starting verse one. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. So there were three prayer times. If you were Jewish at this point, you had the morning prayers that started at 9 a.m. You had the afternoon prayers that started at three and then you had the, the evening prayers that started at sunset. And so this is, the, this is during the second prayer time. And he goes there to take part in the prayer service. And as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Verse three, he says, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Isn't that kind of ironic? Let's just pause for a second. In this story, the beggar is asking for money from the healer. In today's culture, the faith healer is asking for some money from all the rest of us. I just thought that was kind of ironic. And it's interesting actually what Peter and John say. They, Peter and John looked at him intently and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at him eagerly expecting some, a handout, expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver and gold for you, which again is kind of funny because all of these faith healers are rich. That is what they have. That's what it's all about for them. But notice how different it is with Peter and John. He's like, this isn't about money. I don't have silver and gold for you, but, I, but I'll give you what I do have. And he says this, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. I wanna pause here for a second. 
because I want to clear up a misunderstanding that some of you might be feeling right now. I believe in miracles. I want you to know, like, I do believe in miracles. A lot of this name it and claim it stuff is kind of connected, like the Benny Hinn stuff, it's connected to miracles and things like that. I want to make sure you understand. I think it's going too far to say God doesn't do miracles today. God can do miracles. That's not the point of today's message. The point is not that God doesn't do miracles anymore. These things don't happen anymore. It's a different kind of era. And no, that's not all. What I'm saying is I'm exposing a doctrine that's wrong and hurtful and harmful. But I'm not going as far as to say that God doesn't do miracles. We've seen miracles. And God can, God can do miracles. That's not the point. And he's gonna do a miracle here. He does it because Peter says this, get up and walk. So verse seven says this, Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly strengthened and healed. Isn't it interesting, by the way, Luke's a doctor. Luke's the one who wrote Acts. The the same author of the Gospel of Luke is the one who wrote Acts. And it's so interesting, when you know that, you can see that he describes miracles differently than anyone else does, because he's a doctor. So he uses more detail. He says his feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, he stood on his feet, and he began to walk. And then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All right, now pause right here. So again, you name it and claim it, people. You're saying, see, this is a name it and claim it story. God wants us to name it. Peter named it, and he claimed it, and the guy's walking. And I would just say not so fast, because we need to continue to read and see what happens here in the story. Verse 12, Peter saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd. All right, hold on, I gotta just stop right here. Peter saw his opportunity. Think about how opportunistic name it and claim it preachers are. I mean, again, maybe this is just my skepticism. I'm a skeptical guy. I watch some of this stuff and it, make, it just makes me wanna throw up. But they're opportunistic. And here are the two things they're looking to do. Number one, they're trying to get your money. Have you, if you've ever watched any of these guys on TV, it's like, if you send me this money, then that faith, by faith, you'll be able to name and claim whatever you want. It's always connected to you sending them a gift. And I've known many people, sadly, who give their money to this stuff. And you know, so many times, it's people who don't have money to give. And their hearts are right, the followers, their hearts are right, and they're just... They're just kind of sheep without a shepherd, like giving this money away, impoverishing themselves more. And these wealthy people with the big hair, you know, like they're just making more and more money and they're exploiting the masses. They're opportunistic. That's the the opportunity that they see. The second thing that they're doing that I really believe that they're doing is it's an opportunity to make their name great. Do you notice so many of these ministries have individual names as part of the ministry title. That has always really bugged me. It's not about a person. It never was about any servant of God. People, these, some of these faith healers, they see their opportunity to make their name great. And I want you to contrast that with what Peter does here in this story, in this miracle. I want you to see how different Peter's faith healing was than those name it, claim it preachers today. Here's what he said. People of Israel, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? When's the last time a faith healer said that? Peter is totally deflecting the attention and he's saying this is all about Jesus. Pay attention to how much he draws attention to Jesus. He says, for it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all of our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. Peter saw his opportunity not to make money, not to make his name great. Peter saw his opportunity to draw attention to Jesus, to elevate Jesus. He goes on in verse 16, he says, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Faith in Jesus' name. Here's what the Word of Faith movement does. It's right in the title, Word of Faith. Here's what the Word of Faith movement does. That's the same thing as prosperity gospel. Name it, claim it. The Word of Faith says the power is in your word, 
The power is in your faith. And I want, you to tell you, I want to tell you what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the power is in the name of Jesus. The power is not in you. It's not your word. It's not your ability to name something and claim something. It's not, your, it's not even your faith. Think about all the times Jesus talked about faith. He said, if you had faith like a tiny mustard seed, that's like the smallest seed that you could think of. He's, what is he doing? He's saying, it's not about your faith. Your faith is small. Your faith is insignificant. It's not about your faith. It's about the name of Jesus. It's about the object of your faith. And some of you, some of you would say, well, what about all those verses that talk about you know, praying? And I, I, want, I want to read a couple of verses to you about where the power really lies in our prayers. John 15, 7, Jesus, here's what he said. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, may, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now the word of faith people would say, would just take the second half of that. They would just say, ask for anything you want and it will be granted. They'll say, they'll say it says it right there in scripture. Name it and claim it. Ask for it. This is literally their theme verse. Ask for anything you want and it will be granted. But what do we do as Bible students? We look at all of God's word, and we let all of God's word teach us, you can't forget the first part of it. What's the if? If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, then you may ask anything you want, and it will be granted. Because what will you be doing when you're in Christ is you will be in his will. You don't have the power to change God's will. We don't have the power to change God's will. We're not little gods. We can't just say, this is what I want, and we're gonna move heaven and earth, and he's gonna change his mind, we're gonna change his will. No, Jesus teaches us. He says, ask, ask what you want as long as you are aligned with God's will, and it'll happen. I think what, Pete, what was happening in this story with Peter is Peter was, was walking in the spirit, and Peter was speaking and acting and working according to the will of God, and that's why the guy got healed. It was because it was God's will. It wasn't because it was Peter's prayer or Peter's faith. Here's another verse, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. It says this, we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Again, a word of faith person just says, we're confident that he hears us. We can ask for whatever we want. No, actually, 1 John 5 says, we can ask for whatever we want if it pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. But again, what does verse 14 say? Whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And I know what the word of faith people would say to this, is they would say, well, it always pleases God to heal people. It is always, God. this is exactly what the prosperity gospel people say. Here's what they say. It is always God's will that you're healthy and wealthy. That's part of their message. It's always God's, you don't have to wonder if it's God's will. It's always God's will if you're healthy and wealthy. Well, let's talk to Job about that. Or not just Job in the Old Testament. How about Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians? He says, God gave me this thorn in the flesh, and I prayed three different times for him to take it away, and he didn't take it away. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh is, but all we know is that God's response to Paul was, my grace is sufficient in your weakness. I'm not gonna take that thing away. You, uh, suffering is gonna be part of your life is what God's answer was for Paul, but the prosperity gospel preachers say that's, that's never God's will. If you're suffering, if you're sick, then it's because you don't have enough faith or you didn't give us enough money. One of those things. But that's actually not what God's word says. Or how about Trophimus? This is a guy in 2 Timothy 4.20, look it up. Paul talks about this guy that he leaves in Miletus who is sick, Trophimus. Well, Why? Why did Paul leave him there sick? Why didn't Paul just name it and claim it? Because it wasn't God's will to heal Trophimus. Or how about Timothy, 1 Timothy 5, 23. Paul's writing this letter to Timothy and he says, hey, because of your frequent illnesses, take a little, mix in a little bit of wine with your water. That's a famous verse for people who like to drink. And so, um, <laughs> but, the, but the bigger point, the bigger point there is that Paul said, because of your frequent, he probably had like stomach issues. Because of your stomach issues, you should mix wine. Paul, why would he have to say that if it was always God's will to heal everybody? Why didn't Paul just heal Timothy? Why didn't he just heal Trophimus? 
because it's not always God's will that you're healthy and wealthy. That is, that's a false premise in this really dangerous theology. Because again, here's what happens, and we've seen it with so many people. Maybe some of you right here are dealing with this right now. You've got a sickness or whatever, and you're like, how could God let this happen? And maybe some of that thinking has crept in. You're like, I thought that he loved me. I thought that I could just name it and claim it. Well, that's actually not what the Bible says. Even Jesus himself, right in, this, right in Acts chapter three, verse 18, look at what it says there. God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Even Jesus had to suffer. And we're followers of Jesus. Why would we think that we wouldn't suffer? The idea that Christians are called in this world to never have to suffer is not biblical. It's just not. If you have health, praise God for it because it's a gift from him. He doesn't owe it to you. Praise God for it. I praise God for my health whenever I'm sick. Because <laughs> you don't realize it until you're sick, right? Then you're like, man, I had it so good. If you're wealthy, praise God for it. It's a gift from God. And you should be a giver, by the way, but not so that he would give back to you. You should be a giver because he's given so much to you and it's all his anyway. Health and wealth comes from God, but he doesn't, he's not compelled to give it to us. That's not the message of the Bible. Jesus suffered and we might have to as well. In fact, it's one of the only promises we have in his word is that when you come to him, you'll suffer. I, we've, in the last couple of years, we've seen so many people come to faith in Jesus and immediately they get tested. Immediately they get tested. Immediately suffering comes into their life. And imagine if we were prosperity gospel preachers, that they would just bail on their faith. It's not a promise from God. So what is? Do you know that there is something that you can name and claim? It's just not a better car, a better house, or better hair. And we see it here at the end of Peter's message. Acts chapter three, 19 and 20, it says this. So here's what he says to all the people who, who witnessed this miracle. He, you know, the prosperity gospel preachers would have said, look at this, look at me, give to my ministry, give me all your silver and gold. That's not what Peter does because that wasn't the opportunity he saw. He saw the opportunity to share the gospel with them. And he says this in verse 19. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. And then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you Jesus, the appointed Messiah. Here's what you can name and claim. For sure, here's what you can name and claim. Number one, forgiveness of sins. If you name it, you can claim it in the name of Jesus. I mean, this is a message we've seen all throughout the book of Acts so far. He says, look, repent of your sins so that your sins will be wiped away. If you turn to Jesus, remember what we, what we saw in Acts chapter two, he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a promise you can take to the bank. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank God for that. We don't have to wonder when we call on the name of the Lord if he will give us forgiveness of sins. You don't have to wonder about it. You might call on the name of the Lord for healing and he won't give it to you. You might call on the name of the Lord for a better job or prosperity and he might not give it to you. But if you call on the name of the Lord for forgiveness of sins, he'll give it to you. That's awesome. So that's the, one, that's the first thing we can name and claim. It's the spiritual promise. The second thing you can name and claim, it's right there in that verse, times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. You can claim times of refreshment. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about the Holy Spirit. And this is what we learned in chapter two is that when the Holy Spirit came, came upon them, he said, this is what Joel prophesied about, that there was gonna be a time when God would give his Holy Spirit to each one of us individually, not just corporately, not just like, the, like God the Holy Spirit will lead us kind of generally as a corporate body, but the, God the Holy Spirit will lead you individually. And that is referred to as times of refreshment. Jesus himself said that in John 7. He said, anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart, refreshment. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. So the promise that you can take to the bank, two of them, 
forgiveness of sins, and times of refreshment. And here's the good news. That is so much better than health and wealth. You know the best miracle in this whole story? It's so easy to miss the real miracle in the story. This guy that could walk now, this guy that was healed, this guy that had physical healing, the real, the real thing that he had was forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. That was so much better, that was so much more satisfying than the ability to walk for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, however long he had left on earth, because that was all temporary. Forgiveness of sins is eternal. That's why Paul or Peter finished this little sermonette with these words, verse 26, when God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you people of Israel to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. This is the real blessing. Friends, the, big, the biggest problem that I have with health and wealth, with name it and claim it ministry, the biggest problem I have is it gets you focused on the thing that will not satisfy you. The thing that will satisfy you is God himself. And the prosperity gospel gets you focused on temporal things and that won't satisfy. That won't cut it. That's not the real blessing. The real blessing is the thing that we can all name and claim and it's forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in this world and to walk with us and to help us to, be, to honor God in our everyday lives. And this is the promise of scripture that we can take to the bank. If you're here today and you've never received that promise, maybe that's you, maybe today you're like, I, you know, I've never, I've never really made a response of faith to Jesus before. I've never taken him up on this like Peter's message 2,000 years ago, it's the same message we bring every week. That if you turn to the Lord, if you call on the name of Jesus, then you'll be saved. And maybe for some of you, that's just what you need to do. So I wanna invite you to pray right here and at West Haven. Everybody just close your, close your eyes and bow your head. And, and if that's you today, if today you want this to be the day when you trust in Jesus for salvation, then I just invite you to pray a prayer like this, just in your own heart after me. To say, Jesus, I recognize I need you. I'm a beggar just like we see in Acts chapter three. And today I wanna come to you for these two promises. I come to you to ask for forgiveness of sins. And I come to you to ask for times of refreshment that you would give me your Holy Spirit. And I wanna say thank you that these are promises that we can claim and that we can take to the bank. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. And today I receive this real blessing, this lasting blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.